The General Sir John Kotelawala Defence University, founded in the year 1981 as a defence academy, is now one of the eminent defence universities in the region, offering a range of multidisciplinary graduate courses in defence studies and a number of other academic studies. KDU, with its rich history of excellence, assures a high-quality, learner-centred educational experience with its diverse portfolio of academic disciplines, which are globally renowned today, especially as a trendsetter in the local academic sphere. KDU, located in the suburbs of Colombo, over a 50-acre expanse of land, is surrounded by a lake amid natural flora and fauna, enriching the premises with a magnificent view, preserving the natural architecture of the university. The university was named in memory of Sir John Kotalawala, the third Prime Minister of Sri Lanka. selected to the local universities of this state, but I chose KDU mainly because of the disciplinary environment and also the fast admission program of this university. My father selected this university because of this discipline, because he wanted me to uh, get used to a disciplined culture. I heard the atmosphere is different. It's very friendly, there's a military side, there's a civilian side, there's a actually wonderful combination going on here. This esteemed Defence University caters to military students as well as to both local and international students through its undergraduate, graduate and professional programs across nine faculties. Among the student population, KDU has students from the Republic of Maldives, the Kingdom of Bhutan, Nigeria, Rwanda, China, Canada, Australia, the UAE and Vietnam reading for their academic degree programs. With the recent inauguration of its second campus in the southern region, dedicated to built environment and spatial sciences and computing studies, the Allied Health Sciences faculty and the ongoing construction of the first eco-friendly ultra-modern university hospital, KDU is going beyond borders to facilitate growth prospects among students across the globe. University maintains world-class standards to groom and educate its graduates through military and academic training simultaneously to meet the modern-day challenges and have yielded successful results by producing outstanding students in various sectors to serve the nation. The University provides undergraduate degrees in the fields of Defence and Strategic Studies, Medicine, Allied Sciences, Law, Engineering, Management, Social Sciences, and humanities. The university offers students with state-of-the-art infrastructure facilities such as a modern fully-fledged clinical skill lab to aid students following medicine, a robotics lab, access to 24-hour research and free wi Hi, Bowen. I welcome you all for the 14th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kotalawala Defence University, Sri Lanka, under the theme Security, Stability, and National Development in the New Normal. You are joined here today for the plenary sessions of Allied Health Sciences theme towards healthcare advancement and sustainability under pandemic challenges. 
Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Vice Chancellor and the organizing committee, we warmly welcome all guests and invitees in this unique gathering. A word of kind greetings to all senior and junior academics, military officers, and also all conference delegates present in the audience. Before commencing the session's proceedings, ladies and gentlemen, please rise up for the university anthem. today six acclaimed scholars representing Sri Lanka overseas as well, including USA, China, Thailand, Sweden, and New Zealand. Today, we will have the opportunity of listening five distinguished speakers on interesting topics. I am enthusiastic that the session will be an intellectually stimulating one that will lead to certainly a fruitful dialogue. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to formally introduce the chairperson of the session, Professor B. M. H. S. K. Bannahaker, may I have the honor of inviting with respect Dr. D. U. Kottahachi, the Dean, Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, KDU, accompanied by Dr. W. M. Ediriarachi, Senior Lecturer, Department of Radiography and Radiotherapy, Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, KDU.
background of anatomy and based on that he has been able to publish many numbers of research work in several reputed journals both locally and internationally his research areas include human gross anatomy and morphogenesis anatomical variants variations and medical health education professor bannahata is a member of editorial boards of nursing and allied health sciences sri lanka dental journal and international journal of scientific research and publications he has greatly contributed to develop bachelor of science program in physiotherapy and external degree program in physiotherapy of faculty of allied health sciences university of peradin he is a founder member of anatomy society of sri lanka moreover he is a life member of sri lanka dental association and college of dentistry and stomatology sri lanka he has made he has made many invited speeches and joined in as a resource person in several local and international research conferences and workshops on his extensive experience as a senior academic sir we highly value your presence here i cordially invite you to chair this session thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction there's something wrong with my camera i am uh, i apologize for that i will try to work out uh, in between the session uh, so uh, thank you very much again uh, for inviting me to chair this session and i uh, take it a great privilege and thank all the organizers uh, for that uh, so in this session this is uh, the allied health sciences related session uh, preliminary session in the uh, sir george kotalawala defense academy 14th international research conference uh, under the theme towards health care advancement and uh, sustainability under pandemic challenges uh, so we are having five eminent lecturers scheduled for this session uh, they will be talking to you on various topics ranging from the uh, covid 19 pandemic and then uh, uh, i mean uh, it to include some uh, anatomical considerations as well so at health healthcare professionals we are all facing a great challenge during this time due to the pandemic and uh, although certain professions have the luxury of uh, staying away from their workplaces uh, due to the pandemic uh, and during this pandemic situations we in the healthcare profession do not have that luxury so therefore we have to we have to come up with novel ideas to ensure the safety of both the healthcare staff as well as our patients uh in order to provide uh the expected level of care for the patients uh, that we treat so therefore keeping that in mind uh, i am glad to see that uh, this session has scheduled some very highly timely topics so uh, so the first speaker this afternoon is professor steven m albert uh, professor albert uh, is the professor and chair of behavioral and community health sciences and uh, philip b holland endo chair in community health and social justice he is attached to the department of uh, behavioral and community health sciences graduate school of public health university of pittsburgh usa uh, professor albert's research uh, centers on the assessment of health outcome in aging and chronic disease including physical and cognitive function health service use and clinical decision making so uh, there is a lengthy cv which i am not going to into detail at this point so rather than me talking i would like to invite professor steven and albert to deliver his uh, lecture presentation on uh, the us experience with the covid-19 pandemic over to you professor uh, steven um. Greetings to everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation uh, to your conference. Uh, I'm only sorry that we can't be together in person. I send greetings from the United States and the University of Pittsburgh, which is my home base. Uh, I think I need to share my slides. So maybe give me one second to, to do that. And in my brief time here, I will try to give you a picture of the uh, pandemic in the United States and some of what we've learned so far. And it is a very challenging time for us. I will cover the following four topics. 
And uh, beginning now with the slide, I hope you can see from uh, Northern Italy uh, in March of 2020, already a long time ago, you can get a sense of the exponential growth of SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID-19 virus. Uh, really within a month from late February to late March of 2020, uh, Northern Italy saw uh, 60,000 cases in a month, a uh, really striking exponential growth. And if you can look at the slide, you will see that there were many attempts to mitigate or slow down the spread of the disease, and they failed. You can see there were lockdowns and school closures, stay-at-home measures, the uh, closing of the economy, uh, suspension of non-essential economic activities, but all of them uh, together did not slow the growth of the infection. And this raises the question, uh, could we have done things differently earlier in February? Uh, would that have changed uh, the course of the infection? Or perhaps the timing of these closures was not optimal? And a lot of our thinking uh, in the pre-vaccine period was to determine what, what is the right approach for mitigation. So I'll talk a little bit about that, give you a sense of the uh, severity of the epidemic in the United States, and then uh, talk a little more about infection versus vaccination-based community immunity, which we sometimes call herd immunity, and then end with uh, where we are today. Uh, I won't have time to talk about the infodemic, which is a, a new word which refers to the spread of information about the pandemic and some of the damages and challenges that come from wrong information getting out to our populations. So to go back to the beginning, February of 2020, we have our first publication from China about the coronavirus. And already something very alarming uh, emerged. That is that infection uh, was possible even before the index case showed signs or symptoms of disease. In this first publication from the New England Journal of Medicine, the authors estimated about nine or 10% of patients uh, were infectious before they showed symptoms. In fact, now we know that the percentage is more like 30 or even 40% of the transmission occurs before the index patient develops uh, frank symptoms. And that makes control of this uh, infection extremely, extremely difficult. And also to go back already to what seems like ancient history, back in February in 2020, in my own hospital, we were very uh, frightened and really uh, struck by the intensity and the morbidity and mortality of COVID-19. Uh, in our emergency care units, two thirds of older patients were dying with this disease. Uh, we did not know how to treat, even in the ICU, an advanced case of pneumonia uh, from SARS. Uh, very quickly, shortages of uh, medical care uh, became apparent. Uh, our hospital system, which normally has about 80 to 90% ICU bed occupancy, was overwhelmed very, very quickly. Uh, looking at the population uh, strat, uh, perspective, uh, this is a very nice graphic, which shows really uh, the situation in the first months of the infection. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, plotting the exponential growth uh, the uh, side of uh, the straight lines to the left indicate doubling time. So the line furthest to the left indicates doubling every day and the line uh, to the right doubling every month. And you can see just how fast and how consistent the growth of the infection was. However, you can also see that some countries did quite well uh, with early mitigation strategies. So China and South Korea and Japan at the beginning of the infection flattened their curves very quickly, unlike Spain, Italy, France, and the United States and the other European countries 
which continue to see exponential growth and were too little too late in mitigation strategies. Now, China, if you remember, was uh, very, very severe in their mitigation, uh, closing down whole cities, shutting down internal transportation, uh, shutting down its airports and schools very, very quickly. Uh, the other countries were slower to respond. And the uh, implication uh, for the infection is here. You can see the growth rate of the infections. Uh, and where are we today? Well, this is a dashboard from the United States uh, uh, that Johns Hopkins University prepares. We have now crossed 40 million cases in the United States and over 650,000 deaths, uh, striking uh, infection, which we have not seen probably since the uh, influenza pandemic of the early part of the 20th century. But uh, a silver lining is, uh, over now 400 million vaccine doses administered. If you look at the bottom, you will see the plots which speak volumes. Uh, the red plot on the bottom is weekly cases. Uh, the middle is deaths and the far right is vaccine. And unfortunately, you can see on the left in the red curve that we are now facing our fourth or fifth wave with the Delta variant. And there is a story to be told here of the uneven impact of the infection now in the United States, where regions with high vaccination are seeing much lower incidence than regions with low vaccination. And unfortunately, low vaccination is tied to some political movements in the United States, which are very complex and uh, require a lecture in themselves. But here is, I think, the picture of mortality for the United States. The gray curves show a prior year mortality, 2015 to 2019, over each week of the year. And you can see there's a seasonal effect where in the early months, uh, uh, sorry, the early week, zero to 10, our winter months, we always ha have higher mortality. But the red is the COVID year. And you can really see the excess mortality due to this disease. Some of it is COVID itself, and some of it is uh, people dying of other diseases because they could not get to the hospital for medical care. So we have seen 10 and 20% increases in mortality from diabetes or cardiovascular disease, as well as the more immediate effect of COVID. And of course, uh, in that early period centered around week 15, that was our first wave, the alpha variant, and mostly uh, older adults in the United States took the brunt of the infection, especially residents of long-term care facilities. And unfortunately, uh, you can see our later waves toward the end of 2020, the red line is of course elevated again. And if you look at the purple or whatever the color that line is, that's 2021. And you, it looked like we had the infection well under control uh, from a combination of mitigation and vaccination strategies. But the, this, this uh, unfortunately is not complete data. Uh, we are now back in uh, our next wave. And uh, I, I just want to remind you also that uh, despite a hundred years of modern medicine, uh, our uh, early experience with the disease was not very satisfying. We had very, very high death rates. This is a comparison of death rates from New York City in the influenza period from 1918, uh, uh, compared on the right with the mortality from COVID. And uh, you can see that overall prior to the pandemic, Yes, mortality is much lower. In fact, it's half. But once we enter the uh, COVID pandemic, unfortunately, our mortality rate went from uh, 50 to about 200 per 100,000 person years. And uh, at the height of the Spanish flu influenza 100 years ago, it was about 275 deaths per 100,000. So uh, it, our experience was not good. And it took us some time to learn how to handle this disease medically and how to roll out proper public health precautions. Uh, in my own area, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 
the region around the University of Pittsburgh, I can give you a feel for the law, the widespread impact of COVID apart from infection. So here in the United States, we have what we call emergency medical services or EMS calls. You can dial 911 on your telephone and an ambulance will come uh, uh, with the police to investigate a health issue. And uh, what I've plotted here are quarterly, the volume of EMS calls. And you can really see that following the lockdown, which occurred between quarter one and quarter two in 2020, we really did see a decline in EMS service calls. That's not because of COVID, that was because people changed their behavior in huge ways and lowered the risk of things like falls or accidents or injuries, but also people did not call EMS when they had an episode of tachycardia or atrial fibrillation, uh, huge, huge effects of COVID on health more generally as shown here. And so we have had to recognize the uh, limitations and the uh, inadequacies of our data collection, just showing you all the different components uh, in the course of a disease like this and all the different data streams we need uh, to effectively treat and anticipate control of such a disease. And uh, the good news from our modeling efforts and now uh, our empirical data is with vaccination, we really have uh, changed the course of the infection and with proper mitigation strategies, some, the right combination of vaccination and mitigation will allow us to control this infection. And by mitigation, remember, I mean people distancing, wearing face masks, and rationally controlling the opening and closing of schools, airports, transportation, and commerce. And how to do that well is the real challenge. We have our uh, modeling efforts. Here's one shown, which we're now bringing behavior into our infectious disease models. And also we are working out important, uh, effective public health communication strategies. Here's one from my own university, the University of Pittsburgh, where we have a dashboard of cases uh, that students can uh, see uh, levels of infection and uh, change behavior accordingly. And we also have all kinds of infographics. This was from last November, our Thanksgiving holiday, trying to uh, educate people that it's possible for someone to be infectious even though they're asymptomatic and testing at the wrong time will not solve that problem. So we have uh, had to learn very quickly about effective communication as well. Here is something from my own department where we, de we develop videos for our health clinics on uh, masking, on uh, social distancing, and on uh, uh, quarantine and isolation when people develop symptoms. So I don't have a lot of time, but I wanna give you a taste of some of the most advanced thinking going on in the United States now about mitigation. And uh, one of the things we can do now with smartphones and GPS tracking is link movements of populations to places. I don't know if you can see this well, but this is a comparison of March and April of 2020 using data from SafeGraph, which tracks movement on cell phone, on smartphones. And you can see that there's a little less thick lines here. This is connecting people's movement and networks to places on the ground. And that represents the lockdown of Chicago in 2020. And uh, one of the most interesting things we've learned is that you don't need to shut down 100% to have a radical impact on transmission. Uh, with clearer data and understanding, we see there's a, a nonlinear relationship between people attending, uh, let's say, commerce, a store, uh, and the risk of infection. That curve is not a straight line. It may be possible to open up a, a site at 30% or 20% uh, 
uh, rather than 0% and have a very strong gain in reduction of infections. And we can even target this by small geographic units. And with the proper data system, it may be possible to uh, mitigate transmission and yet not shut down the economy as a whole. So we are very interested in new data systems that will allow us for rational uh, control over population movement to minimize infection. I also want to raise for you one large controversy we have, we've had uh, in the United States, but also in the UK and other places. Uh, you know, it, it's a contrast of infection-based immunity versus vaccine-based immunity. And there was a group of academics who put out a declaration called the Great Barrington Declaration, uh, which said that we should really let the infection burn through a population. That is the quickest way to have community immunity or what we sometimes call herd immunity. And uh, it would be possible to do this by uh, uh, protecting those who are at higher risk. Well, it sounds seductive and it sounds reasonable, but this approach turns out to be wrong. And a number of us try to show why this is a bad idea. I myself uh, uh, published paper on this as well. And it's really, really quite difficult to segment a population to protect those at highest risk while letting the remainder of the population uh, move at will. And the reasons are here, the at-risk group in any population is quite large. For example, in the United States, 6% of people over age 65 have two or more medical conditions. Well, that's 2 million people. It's impossible to protect those folks, many of whom live in the community. Uh, also, it was not just the older, sicker population that developed COVID and required hospitalization. We are suffering with this now with the Delta variant where many young people are in hospital and dying. Uh, and as I showed you already, uh, the high stress on hospital care compromises care for the whole population, not just those affected by COVID. On the behavioral side, it is impossible, we have learned, to separate low and high risk groups. They live together, they interact. The high risk group uh, is transmitting disease even before there are symptoms and our testing protocols are just not good enough right now to get those tests out in a timely way with results to people. And not everybody is willing to self-isolate and quarantine. So uh, it is a real challenge and the Great Barrington Resolution really uh, was not an effective approach. The more rational strategy is to combine vaccination and mitigation in rational ways. And so this is where we are in the United States right now. The red areas indicate census tracts and zip codes in the United States that have high infection. You can see it's the Southern United States, in particular, uh, the, the, the Southern belt uh, from Texas to Louisiana to Florida, and then up into Missouri, Virginia, West Virginia. Uh, this is the hotspot uh, of infection in the United States. These are the areas with the lowest vaccination rate. These are the areas with the lowest uh, mitigation uh, efforts. And unfortunately, uh, as we've learned from uh, our studies of infectious disease, just having 50 or 60% of the population vaccinated is not enough to control the course of an infection. And uh, uh, unfortunately, as I mentioned a second ago, we have uh, all kinds of lack of unity right now in the response to the infection uh, and uh, lots of mistrust in science and in government, uh, which is making it very difficult to uh, protect the public's health. And so here's where we are today, and I will conclude here. I'm sorry if I went a minute or two over. Uh, COVID in September 2021, our month now, we have uneven vaccination uptake in the United States, uneven acceptance of mitigation, hot spots of infection, and overwhelming of hospital surge capacity in some parts of the country. On the other hand, 
uh, new knowledge and new strategies for redesigning environments, both for ventilation and also for mitigation, and probably beginning shortly in the United States, following the example of Israel and some other countries, we will see a third uh, vaccination effort. And I think that's probably where we're going today. So I would like to thank you very much for this opportunity to address you. I'm sorry for going quickly through a very complicated story, but I'm, uh, I hope I've uh, piqued your interest and I hope to, to see more uh, collaboration and of course, greater vaccine accessibility across the globe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Albert. Uh, and uh, I would like to announce to the audience that uh, at the end of all the presentations, there will be a question and answer session. And uh, I would like to invite Professor Albert to stay with us uh, until that time. Thank you again. So, uh, and I managed to solve my technical issue during the uh, lecture as well. So uh, the second presentation this afternoon is uh, on a, again, a timely topic. And uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, so we have to look for novel ideas and uh, uh, new techniques and other things to combat this uh, pandemic. So therefore, uh, we will listen to Professor Meng Liang, uh, who is from the School of Medical Imaging, Tianjin Univers Medical University, China, about uh, the use of artificial intelligence in uh, radiological diagnosis. Uh, uh, Professor Liang Meng has obtained his uh, PhD in 20, uh, 2006 from Institutes of uh, Automation, Chinese Academy of Science in China. And uh, he is currently working as a professor and the vice dean of School of uh, Medical Imaging, Tianjin Medical University in China. Uh, so he has uh, his postdoctoral work uh, done at the Oxford University London and with uh, also He's, uh, he has served as a research scientist at the University College London for several years. With all this experience and um, his research in this field of uh, artificial intelligence, I am sure that his experience and his ideas will be very important uh, for our community as well. Uh, so I would like to invite, without taking much time, Professor Meng Liang to uh, do his presentation. Over to you. Okay, good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, I don't know if you can uh, hear me clearly. Yes, we I, can hear you correct, clearly, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen, just a second. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks for the nice introduction and uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Meng Liang from China. And first of all, let me uh, send my best regards to all of you uh, to stay safe and well protected from the, uh, in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the use of artificial intelligence in uh, radiological diagnosis. Um, I'm going to talk about four um, aspects. So firstly, um, when medical imaging means AI, uh, because my background is actually an AI engineer and I'm mainly working on uh, how to use AI technique uh, in the medical imaging uh, area. And secondly, uh, let's see how AI can help in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I'm only just going to um, touch this point uh, using two examples, uh, two uh, research work uh, recently published uh, to see how AI can help in this uh, severe situation. And uh, in, the uh, in the third part, um, uh, this is actually my own research interest uh, is about using AI in pain and schizophrenia research. And lastly, I'm going to uh, talk about some challenges uh, AI is facing. Uh, so um, I don't know if you know that uh, in the first issue of uh, Nature Medicine in uh, 2019, in the same issue, they published more than 10 articles. Uh, all of them are focusing on uh, the applications of AI in medicine, in medical areas. It shows that it's um, the artificial intelligence is such a hot topic in medical area. 
Well, among um, these uh, AI applications in the medical area, um, using AI uh, for the radiological diagnosis is actually uh, one of the most important area. Um, in China, actually, in this area, we, we often say in, this era, in these years, um, these two sentences, uh, the meaning uh, is about um, imaging leads the way towards precision medicine and the technology leads the way towards precision imaging. So uh, we are trying to express the, the, the idea that using uh, advanced technologies such as AI, um, which can uh, really push the medical imaging uh, field uh, move forward. Okay. Uh, so um, when medical imaging P uh, meets AI, so we want to use AI to help the human doctors uh, to examine the medical images to assist the doctors uh, to make their decisions in the disease diagnosis. So this is actually a competition um, between the computer vision versus human vision. So who will win? Uh, well, um, we all know that uh, the machine and human, they have their own advantages. What, what we should do is to combine these two together, uh, these two different types of intelligence together to make us uh, a better ability uh, to diagnose diseases. Um, the medical imaging is actually a perfect uh, area for AI to be used uh, for the uh, diagnosis of diseases because of some realities in the, uh, in the clinical practice of medical imaging uh, diagnosis. Uh, for example, uh, in many countries, uh, such as in, in China, I think there, uh, it's probably a similar situation in Sri Lanka. Um, there, uh, there is a, a shortage of radiologists and radiographers. Uh, well, in the even with the shortage, uh, the medical imaging examination, the amount of the medical imaging examination is rapid, rapidly increasing. Uh, we have a lot, a lot of uh, medical images to examine um, every day. And, and also um, the distribution, the, the amount and the level of radiologists um, is very unbalanced across different regions in the country. For example, in some hospitals, in some areas, you can find uh, very good doctors with uh, very good experiences, but in some areas, um, you, 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 you can't find, you, know, you can only see less experienced uh, doctors. Um, uh, but fortunately, uh, in, the medical, uh, in the medical imaging, uh, the image format and also the imaging protocols is mostly uh, already uh, standardized, which is a, a, a very uh, good condition for AI to be used in this area to facilitate uh, the, uh, the application of AI in the medical imaging diagnosis. So this reality provides AI excellent opportunities to excel in assisting uh, radiological diagnosis. So what AI can do. So for example, the, uh, the big data-based uh, radiological diagnosis uh, using AI, and also uh, AI can, um, can be perfect for the quantitative lesion measurements and evaluation. So this is the thing that a computer uh, is good at uh, compared with person. And also the intelligent optimization of image quality. So it can help us to get better quality uh, images. And also it makes the scanning time and dosage less while still keeping the uh, a good image quality. Um, <clears throat> so AI can do so many things. And also we are trying to translate AI uh, systems products into the clinical practice. Um, in US, the FDA has already approved uh, quite a few AI-based um, products in the clinical practice, also in China. For example, last year, um, the, the China government uh, approved the first 
medical imaging AI system, um, which is a computing uh, um, AI measurement computing software for the uh, coronal uh, artery based on the CT scans. And also last year, they approved uh, this, the first medical imaging uh, AI system for the uh, lung cancer screening. So both of the AI system uh, were approved last year by the Beijing Municipal uh, Medical Products Administration. So these are all. Uh, these are the signs um, showing that AI has the great potential to be translated and to be actually used in the clinical practice. Okay. Uh, so secondly, let's see um, how AI can help in the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, I'm only going to show you uh, two uh, examples. Actually, if you search uh, on the PubMed, you can see so many papers about using AI for the uh, detection of COVID-19 pneumonia patients. Uh, so, uh, for example, there's one paper published last year on cell. Uh, it's about a clinical applicable AI system for accurate diagnosis, quantitative measurements, and prognosis of COVID-19 pneumonia using computed, uh, using CT scans. So the, uh, this AI system was developed based on uh, 40,880 slices from um, 83 uh, the, the novel coronavirus pneumonia patients, uh, 91 common pneumonia patients and 86 normal controls. So the AI models, the machine learning models, they developed actually performed very well uh, in distinguishing um, the different patients so they can identify uh, successfully the NCP patients from the common pneumonia patients and also the normal controls with, with very high uh, classification accuracies. Um, <clears throat> And also there's another uh, example, uh, which is a paper published also last year on nature medicine. Um, it's artificial intelligence enabled a rapid diagnosis of patients with COVID-19. And this work, they integrate the chest CT scans uh, with the clinical symptoms and also other data with, uh, such as the exposure history and uh, 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 laboratory testing data. And based on this multi-source data, they developed a machine learning uh, model, which also performed very well. Um, the performance is comparable with uh, a senior a thoracic radiologist so these two examples, although there's, there hasn't been uh, an AI system actually uh, developed and used in the clinical practice for detection of COVID-19 patients, um, but this work, this work, this shows AI has great potential uh, to be used in the future uh, and can help us to fight the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. Okay, so in the third part, I'm going to talk about my own interest. Uh, it's about using AI in pain and schizophrenia research. So pain is such a common problem. It's a common system uh, among so many clinical diseases, uh, which is also a very difficult um, disease to treat. So pain by definition is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experiences. So by definition, pain is a subjective feeling. So uh, for, a, uh, for a subject feeling, as a subject feeling, it can be easily affected by emotions, by your environment, and also even by your culture, and et cetera. Uh, many factors that affect your pain feelings. And also for some um, special populations, for example, for babies, and also some patients with a uh, language problem, they can, uh, for these patients, they cannot really tell you whether they are in pain or uh, how painful they are. So we need a tool uh, to objectively assess pain. So what can we do? So although pain is a subjective feeling, but in the end, pain is generated by our brain. So it is a result of uh, the brain activity in our brain. 
uh, the brain the neural activity in our brain so can we use the neural activity the the brain imaging data uh, to objectively identify pain and assess pain so what you uh, what you are seeing now on my slides um, is the the brain activation maps so the first row is the brain activation maps by painful stimuli and the second map is the the brain activation map um, elicited by the tactile non-painful stimuli and you can see that these two activation maps are very similar and um, it turns out that we cannot really see any differences between the painful activation map and the non-painful activation map using our human eyes so um, human eyes plus uh, brain imaging technique it fails in identification of pain but if we apply AI technique uh, on the brain imaging data, we find that we can successfully uh, distinguish the brain activation maps elicited by pain and by touch. So it shows that AI has the potential to be successfully uh, used in pain assessment and identification. Similarly, for schizophrenia, it is one of the most severe mental disorders worldwide, but uh, the, uh, the diagnosis of schizophrenia is still very problematic in clinical practice. So it usually, um, how the, the schizophrenia is diagnosed, so the, the doctors is just ask the patients many questions uh, based on some guidelines, um, the doctors will observe and see how the, pa uh, how the patients answer their questions and they, they score them. So based on the scores, the, the doctor will decide whether uh, he, is, um, he can be diagnosed uh, with the schizophrenia or not. So this way of diagnosing a disease is very subjective. It is strongly relying on doctor's experience, and it often results uh, the, the fact that the patients are often misdiagnosed. So um, uh, based on this uh, situation, can we develop an objective tool uh, to diagnose uh, the um, schizophrenia? So my idea is also using brain uh, imaging data uh, for the diagnosis of schizophrenia. Um, with many years of research on the, the brain abnormalities in schizophrenia patients, we found that the schizophrenia, uh, schizophrenia patients, they have alterations in their brain structure, uh, both in the gray matter and also white matter. And also we can see alterations in the functional brain network, both in the functional connectivity network and also the effective connectivity networks. So it shows that the schizophrenic patients, they have abnormalities in their brain. So can we use uh, their abnormality pattern uh, to, um, to diagnose whether this patient is, has the schizophrenia or not. So we, uh, we um, attempted uh, to do this, to develop an AI model for objective diagnosis of schizophrenia. And we find that um, by fusing, so we, if we put all different types of uh, data together, fusing different data together, we can um, significantly improve the classification accuracy and with a good performance in identifying uh, the schizophrenic patients uh, from the normal controls. So this is just uh, some preliminary uh, attempts uh, for, uh, for the objective diagnosis of schizophrenia. So in, the, uh, in these two examples I just showed you, uh, in the first example, in the pain assessment, uh, we are trying to move from a subjective report by patients in the current clinical practice to an objective evaluation by AI system. And in the second example, um, for the schizophrenic um, diagnosis, we are trying to move from a subjective evaluation by doctors uh, to an objective evaluation by AI system, or at least uh, can we use AI uh, to objective 
uh, to objectively evaluate the patients to assist the doctors to make their decisions about whether this person has schizophrenia or not. So this is how um, I use AI to uh, in the in the medical imaging uh, research area in the pain and uh, the schizophrenia assessment. Um, okay, so lastly, I'm going to um, talk about some challenges AI is facing in the application um, in the medical imaging diagnosis. So often we were asked um, these two questions. Uh, for example, can we really trust AI? Uh, or even can radiologists be replaced by AI? Well, um, these two questions are actually very sensitive questions and uh, uh, my uh, answers would be yes and no um, to both uh, questions. So can we really trust AI? Well, um, currently, um, uh, personally, I don't think I can because I know that there's still a long way for AI to go to be really um, accurately and successfully to be used in the real clinical practice. But in the future, I'm very optimistic. And I don't think the radiologist to be, uh, uh, to be ever to be replaced by AI because um, human has human advantages. But some of the work uh, radiologists do currently will be replaced by AI in the future. I think that is certain as well. Uh, so to really um, get that point uh, that the AI can be successfully uh, used and translated in the clinical practice is still facing uh, many challenges. For example, um, we have to find the right scenarios to, to apply AI system to, be, uh, to make it successful, to make it really uh, to be helpful. Um, and also uh, we need better uh, machine learning algorithms and we need faster uh, machines. And also we need big data to train our models uh, to make them um, to behave like an experienced doctor. And also uh, the data quality uh, is often very uh, bad um, when we train the machine learnings and we need better quality data. And also we often find the data is missing and we need to tackle these problems and also the, data, the issue of data safety and also patient privacy and, and also um, often we, we lack of uh, the golden standards to train our, uh, our machines and as, et cetera. Uh, there are so many challenges AI is facing, but I'm still optimistic that in the future, AI can develop very fast and we will have a good AI system and products to really help uh, the radiologist to, uh, to do better work. Uh, in, diagnose, uh, in, di in diagnosing diseases. Okay, let me conclude and finish with um, a saying in, in Chinese that the meaning is, uh, is something like, uh, well, the prospects are bright, the roads have twists and turns. This is how AI will progress um, in the medical imaging diagnosis, uh, in my opinion. So uh, I think we should and we will let AI help in medical imaging diagnosis. Okay, uh, that's all um, for my talk and thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor. This is the Meng Liang uh, for your presentation, uh, drawing the, uh, our attention to the novelties and the, the new prospects, as well as uh, uh, presenting your, uh, finishing your presentation on time, which is very important. Thank you very much again. So I hope that you will also remain with us uh, towards the end of this session to answer any questions that might arise from the members. Thank you again. Okay, thank you. Yes, I will. Right, uh, so uh, let me take you into the third presentation. Now uh, we have been uh, talking about the radiology and again, this one still uh, is going to touch on the radiology. Uh, the, the third speaker is a scientist from Thailand. 
so assistant professor napapong uh, pognapang so i am uh, going to introduce him very briefly he is uh, <clears throat> is assistant professor and the director of the master of sciences degree program in radiological technology at the faculty of medical technology uh, mahidol university in the city of bangkok in thailand and uh, he is uh, really an international researcher and international be recognized uh, teacher and a scientist i am sure uh, because uh, he has worked or he has obtained his phd in the in medical physics in the university of texas and uh, he is he has a double license in the uh, republic of thailand as a uh, uh, yes uh, as a professional licensed radiographer and a medical physicist so uh, really an all round i am sure and he has been invited to teach and uh, make presentations in uh, the universities and other institutions of several countries including malaysia indonesia philippines vietnam and laos and uh, he is a recognized uh, as i said uh, internationally renowned and recognized scientist so the so he is currently developing a diploma program in radiography in laos under the who funded project and he is also a uh, member of many professional associations in thailand and uh, rest of the world so i would like to invite uh, him to talk about uh, radiological technology's role in the global health uh, for the covid-19 pandemic so as i mentioned so we are talking we are amidst the pandemic and we have to find ways to serve our patients and our uh, citizens better so i am sure this is going to help you uh, in that aspect Welcome back. Thank you very much, and Ayuba Wan Sri Lanka. Um, I'm very happy to be invited to give a, a talk, a presentation in this conference, and uh, to, it's it's a challenge in time of pandemic that uh, we cannot travel, so this is going to be online. But I do hope that we can travel again soon, and I could, I, I will. Go to 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 Sri Lanka again for my third visit. Um, my presentation is pre-recorded, so um, I think uh, the, the organizer will will do the uh, presentation for 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 me. My name is Mark. Are you are you one? Hello everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me to be one of the speaker in this event. And the topic of my talk is radiological technology role in global health for COVID-19 pandemic. content of my talk, I would like to have a short introduction of the organization that I belong, the International Society for Radiographers and Radiological Technologists, ISRRT, and also our activities in response to this COVID-19 pandemic, including how we set up the standards, how we do international collaboration, we respond to what members need and last but not least it's about the communication that we have 
as the International Organization for Radiological Technologists or Radiographers Profession, the ISRT was founded back in 1952 and at present we represent over 500,000 radiographers and radiological technologists globally. We work closely with the World Health Organization and in this talk I will show a couple of the activities we did together with the WHO in regards to the COVID-19 pandemic and also if we focus on the radiation protection aspect of the practice, we have a collaboration closely with the International Atomic Energy Agency or the IAEA and European Federation of Radiological Societies, EFRS. Also, recently we have a lot of activity with the International Commission for Radiological Protection, ICRP. As I mentioned, the ISRT is the voice of half a million radiography and radiation therapists profession worldwide. We have a mission statement to improve the standards of delivery and practice of medical imaging and radiation therapy throughout the world by acting as International Liaison Organization for Medical Radiation Technology and by promoting quality patient care, education, and research in the radiation medicine science. Current board member, we have Ms. Donna Newman from the U.S. as a president, and we have uh, three vice presidents, three regional directors, one treasurer, and we have director of education, director of professional practice and director of the public relations. Myself is the vice president taking care of Asia and Australasia region. Looking into our practice as we know that uh, radiography or radiological technology profession, the practice varies from one place to another and there are also different terminology for what we do and who we are. So to this end, I just made a reference to Joe Yander from uh, Australia, uh, published in Journal of Medical Radiation Science. To this end, it is unfortunate that New Zealand in terms of technology is still used along with the message it sends. So this is uh, from New Zealand colleague. Again, when we look into a global perspective, even pre we practice may, our practice may vary from one place to another, but when it comes to the time of this COVID-19 pandemic, we all face the same situation. I know that uh, our colleague in China faced it first and then we have a lot to learn from you as I we know that at first we did not know much about this COVID-19 at all and then we learned from from the experience from the Chinese uh, colleague and then when the pandemic go further beyond China to other countries then we have a lot of new things to learn also as the virus mutates so the the thing that we have uh, as an issues around this COVID pa pandemic include we have also also limited access to practice standard for the profession. So we may have the general guideline for radiation protection and infection control, but not specific to this COVID-19, which is a very new pandemic a disease. So in terms of infection control and patient care in special circumstances, also in many places we have problem with access to limited access to the uh, personal protective equipment or PPA and this happened because uh, when we first um, encounter with this pandemic um, we do not have enough for, for sure we did not have enough because the demand is so high and one of the very very important issue is the frontliner status who we are we know that we are in the front line but how how would we be recognized by other profession that work working along with us the 
the first thing that we did um, was that we set up the standards. The World Health Organization contacted us as the their colleague because we are the uh, NGO, uh, non-profit, uh, non-government organization that have official relationship with the World Health Organization. And World Health Organization contacted us that uh, the COVID-19 virus continue to evolve. And, and they know that uh, the ISRT member worldwide is trying to prepare and respond to this pandemic so in in this regards we are looking uh, for the standard on how to to deal with this kind of pandemic so what we did was we collaborated with the world health organization in response to to this if you look into our collaboration with world health organization there were two documents published already you can check on our website www.isrrt.org that include COVID-19 resource update uh, ISRT member contribute to development of COVID-19 education resources the first document that we contribute was on a WHO document on COVID-19 use of chest imaging in COVID-19 a rapid advice guide as one of the team multidisciplinary team consists of a radio radio radiologist and us radiographer we work together and then we come up with the this guideline and also we also help publish with the iaea the international atomic energy agency uh with this document on um covid19 pandemic technical guidance for nuclear medicine department so this is a very important document also that you can get access online when we look at the covid19 guideline uh what comes to us first was that well, how how would we dress we learn a lot from from our Chinese friend uh, when when you start encounter this disease, but the standard vary from from one place to another, and also uh, from one profession to another. So what it means is like uh, medical doctors, nurses, and radiographers. We may have different rates depending on the uh, procedures that you involve with the COVID patient or the suspected COVID patient. So what we did was that we published together with our health organization, the ISRT COVID-19 guidelines. So what we had was uh, kind of outline you can check into our website. We have control checklists from preparation uh, of the patient from during the procedures and also post procedures. So the tasks that we, we have include step by step and this is the clear instruction so that the radiographers and the technologists worldwide can adopt also we have all the details that you can also check on our website on top of this um, collaboration with the World Health Organization and the International Atomic Energy Agency, among radiographers and radiological technologists profession, we have international collaboration in terms of networking. Since we have members more than 80 countries and territories, we implement a platform called uh, Facebook Live Social Media to promote collaboration and bridge ISRT member society together uh, in the current best practice and this event of Facebook live this is just one of the, the platform uh, pretty similar to uh, to what you have here in in, in, in China um, that you use different platform um, and this is uh, the Facebook one and we uh, normally have every two weeks we have the webinar one as the talk show on the topic of interest and another one will be real web webinar as the education webinar so during the first uh, four to five episodes that we we did uh, starting a um, couple months ago uh, we first focus on issues around the COVID-19 pandemic and we get a good response.
one of the episode that we did was a uh, response to what members need as i mentioned before since we have more than 80 member societies from from around the world so our members have different challenge and we do listen to them and one episode we invited uh, normally we invite four representatives from four regions one from the europe one from america one from asia and sometimes we have one from africa also and in this episode we uh we entitled response to what members need Need the role of radiography professional organization during COVID-19 pandemic. This uh, episode, we got a lot of feedbacks and what we got was a uh, response and, and there are a couple things in common uh, from uh, among our member societies. The first issue is the standard of practice in dealing with COVID-19 and most of them, the members, they need this, either from their national organization or the international organization in case they don't have the national guidelines. And the second issue is the problem in access to surgical masks, N95 masks, and personal protective equipment, PPE. And this is very um, common problem across the world that we don't have uh, enough access to these uh, equipment to protect ourselves when we do have to contact with the uh, COVID-19 patient. And one of the most important um, issue is that the recognition of the profession as a frontliners. Why is this important? Because when we are recognized as frontliners, so there, there, there should be a necessity showing uh, the profession and what, what we need to have in terms of protective equipment when we deal with the patient and our input on the processes that the patient comes into uh, for investigation or treatment. And last one, uh, in in some place you have surplus of the technologies or radiographers, but in many, many places we have shortage of manpower. And then when we practice in this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, normally one of the guidelines that is very clear is that we have to separate the group of technologies or radiographers into two groups. Some country call clean and dirty technologists, but uh, we would prefer to be called as contact and non-contact technologists. Contact mean the technologists that position the patient, uh, perform the uh, procedures with the patient, and non-contact uh, technologists or non-contact radiographers are those who sit in the console and control the uh, x-ray machine without contacting the, the, the patient at all. We got some responses from the ISRT as I mentioned before. So the first one is the ISRT response document appropriate and safe use of medical imaging and radiation therapy with infection control measures considered in addition to standard radiation protection procedures. Well, we know that when we practice, radiation protection is the key for, for uh, patient safety. But with this pandemic, there's another issue about infectious control. So what we did was we have on our website called COVID-19, ISRT develops resources for members to use in COVID-19 pandemic. When we talk about how important we are when we practice in the clinical environment of course it is your profession you said that you are important but how can you prove it um, we got a lot of feedback from around the world about this uh, recognition of the prof profession as a frontliner. Um, as I always mention, practice varies from one place to another, but it is evident that the radiography profession is among the frontliners in this pandemic. Why is that? The patients come in, they need chest x-ray, and they also need chest CT sometimes. So we deal with the patient directly. And what we want to have is the international perspective provide good evidence-based feedback to the authority in many countries where 
the profession still struggle to get proper recognition and this episode was was the most hit one the episode was clicked to watch more than 10,000 times with 78,000 people reach on this uh, Facebook link we have we had four speakers and and two panelists at that time we have Philippe Jusong from uh, from France he's our treasurer we have Pichu Luna from the Philippines representing Asia Philippe uh, representing Europe and for the Americas we have Reshma Mahipat she is the president of the um, Society of Radiographers from Trinidad and Tobago to represent the Americas and the fourth one we got radiographers from South Africa and we have Stuart Whitley which is who is the ISRT director of professional practice he is the panelist normally I, I am the host for this event well, we got a lot of feedback from from this from this uh, episode, and we have uh, managed to to have somewhat a solution uh, sh from experience sharing from from advanced country, so that the uh, countries that still struggle with this can learn from them, and can adopt the the situation, and then deal with the government in terms of re recognition of the profession as the frontliners. Again, communication during this COVID uh, pandemic is very important. We get a lot of communication with our member societies. And this is a good example. This is what we got from Nigeria, a country in Africa. And they publish on our news and view about Nigeria radiographers as frontline worker. This is pretty clear um, that they show it on a photo, on a picture, how important the professional can be be and also from uh, from the Philippines uh, Pichi Lunar uh, also presented part of the, the Philippine Association of Radiological Technologists initiative to support recognition of the frontline workers during COVID pandemic in the Philippines and this is a good sample example for other countries also in conclusion, what we have learned so far, the COVID-19 has been a huge challenge to humans. And COVID-19 is also a new kind of pandemic that the medical professions like us have to learn how to deal with it quickly. But sometimes it was not quick enough. Like what we have seen so far in so many countries that we have to struggle on how to deal with it and how to deal with how to perform our duties and how to save ourselves from this contagious disease. And radiographers and radiological technologists are one of the frontliners medical profession who provide imaging service to COVID-19 and suspected COVID-19 infected patients. And during the, the past almost two years, the profession has globally contributed not only to the professional services, but also academic and community services. We have learned how to deal with the pandemic together, and we hope to overcome this huge challenge in human history together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Napapong, for your presentation, and uh, I invite you to also uh, to wait until the end of this uh, session to answer the questions. So we are running a little bit uh, behind the schedule, so uh, without taking much time, I will go to the next presenter. Uh, our next presenter is from Sweden, that is Professor Martin Persson. Uh, he is a professor of health sciences at the uh, Christiansted University, Sweden, and he's also a visiting professor in the Faculty of Health and Ap Applied Sciences in the University of West of England, uh, located at Bristol, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, professor Martin has a has earned PhD in medicine and MSc degree in public health and psychology. Uh, so uh, his work reaches many parts of the globe, including Asia, Australia, Europe, North America, and South America. So uh, he will be uh, presenting or talking to us today uh, with the health outcomes concerning vulnerable groups and uh, a European perspective. So he'll be talking about uh, an area that we discuss very uh, rarely or rather uh, very scarcely, right? Over to you, Professor Ned. Thank you. 
so much. I will just share the screen here. And start. Let's see. Let's see if we can get the presentation going here. Oh, yeah. there we go. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much for your kind invitation to this conference. And I can just agree with all the previous speakers. It would have been such a blessing to be able to come to Sri Lanka and meet all of you face to face. So I'm going to talk today about health outcomes concerning vulnerable groups, a European perspective. But health outcomes for vulnerable groups is also very much a global perspective. And if we put it in relation to COVID-19, there have been some recent studies that in this current pandemic, there is evidence that those individuals occupying lower socioeconomic position and or lower education are more prone to developing severe COVID-19 or dying from it. So this is about keeping this in mind when we work with different segments of population, they are at various risk. Let's see. Oh, yes. So the European Union, we currently consist of 27 countries with a collective population of about 446 million inhabitants. And our economic situation in Europe varies quite differently. So if you look at the volume index of GDP per capita in the perch purchasing power standards, PPS, as this map represents. And, and this map is expressed in relation to the European Union average set to 100. So in other words, if a country is above 100, they're doing better. And consequently, if a country is below 100, they're doing worse. As you can see them on this map, there are numerous countries where GDP per capita in PPS are below 100. And you see there's a quite a disparity in the European Union. And this leads us then to health expenditure per inhabitants. If you look here from Romania, for example, it's very low compared to Luxembourg or even Sweden or Switzerland. And obviously, this has a big impact in relation to how we can provide our health care. I think this PowerPoint here doesn't really want to do what I want to do on the, here we go. Excuse for that. That means that each country has different resources and that can have an impact on the provisional health care and can therefore be important to determining health and social outcomes. And when we then start looking at determining health outcomes, it's, oops, sorry, this is something going wrong here. It's not only the amount available to spend on healthcare that is influential in determining health outcomes, it's also the unequal distribution of wealth. And one example is child mortality. When we look at child mortality, for example, in 2013, child mortality was 4.9 births per 1,000 in the UK, which was about 25% higher than France, Germany, Italy, and Spain, and almost as twice as high when compared to Sweden. One aspect on why the difference between child mortality rates between the United Kingdom and Sweden is due to the unequal distribution of wealth in the UK society. And this then leads us to inequalities. And what are inequalities? There is absolutely something wrong here. <laughs> Let's, so apologies for this. That's it. So what are inequalities? Inequalities for variance. We talk about different groups in our society. And with that, we look at social marginalized groups. And who are they then? who are the social marginalized groups in our society. For example, but not limited to, individuals who are unemployed, have disability, experience mental health problems, for example, low educational attainment, they can be migrants or refugees, 
they are what we call in the risk to be socially marginalized. And being a member of a socialized marginalized group also increases the risk of health inequalities, poverty, and social exclusion. So in 2017, 22.4% of the Euro European population, that is about over 100 million people, lived in households at risk for poverty and social exclusion. But this has a big difference between the countries, as you can see in this picture here. In Bulgaria, 32.5% are at risk for poverty or social exclusion. While in Czechia, for example, it's only 12.5%. So when we start looking at the healthcare we can obtain in the different countries and also looking at the risk of poverty and social exclusion, as you all are esteemed scholars and students, you understand there's a big difference. So in Europe, it depends where you're born, also depends on which kind of health care and your risk for poverty and social exclusion. But we're going to look at the indicators for poverty or social exclusion, because this is something we teach to healthcare professionals in Europe and also in the other parts of the world, of course. We're going to specifically look at sex and age group, including children, household types, educational attainment, and where you are from and reside actually matters. So if we start on a sex and age group, and we're again looking at the people at risk of poverty or social exclusion by sex and age, we can say in total, as we know now, but women has a higher risk in Europe to belong into this group. And if you're younger, is even higher than the average. And that goes on until 24 years of age. Then between 25 and 49, it lowers. But when you get older, it starts again. And apologies for very sensitive. <laughs> and so on. So we have various age groups when you take in consideration. And when we look at children, we see, again, when you look at the different countries in Europe, 35.8% of children in Romania are at risk for poverty and social exclusion, compared to 11, almost 12% in Slovenia. For example, in EU, the average is 22.5%. And as mentioned, United Kingdom is quite high as well, almost 30%. So these are the factors when we work globally or internationally, but also locally, we need to pay attention to. And we then start looking at household types, for example. Yes. Then we see, depending where you are living, that's kind of a household, we see a single person with dependent children are at the highest risk to be in the poverty or social exclusion. Then we do one adult younger than 65 years, and so on. So you see there's a big difference. And as a healthcare professionals, we need to be aware of these factors. Because often worth considering that many households are made up of young unemployed people or pensioners, in many cases, women. And this group had a higher than average risk of poverty or social exclusion. A good thing is, though, when we look at this, from the orange line is 2010 and the blue is 2017, is that, ah, apologies, this is really annoying. Don't know what's going on with my presentation. It's, it is getting better, at least. We are improving. So when we look at education, then, and we look at the difference level, from less than primary, upper secondary, or university territory. And those at risk for poverty and social exclusion are those that are in the highest degree they have obtained is less than primary, primary and lower secondary education. And this has increased as from 2010 to 2017, and as well as upper secondary and so on. Those in higher education 
as we know, they are not as high risk versus the others. So educational level is a very fa important factor to consider. And it also belongs to how the parents are. So parents that either have a primary or lower social, secondary education increase the risk for a child to be a poverty or social exclusion by almost 63% of children that have parents that are either primary or lower secondary are at risk for poverty or social exclusion in contrast to parents with university. That's only nine and a half percent. But what it's also important where you're from and where side also has an impact. If uh, we look at this data, we see if you're born in a non EU country and living in the country that you, you work, for example, in Sweden, if I'm born in Sweden and working, or in Europe, I have a risk of 20.7% of being in poverty and social exclusion. If I'm from another European country, if I'm in Sweden and start working in Bulgaria, my risk would go up to 22.7%. However, if I come, for example, from Africa continent, you go up to 38.3%. So this becomes a big difference. And when we look at across Europe, you can see the EU average, you see it, where you're reporting, where a person born and works in and other EU country is quite close. And if you come outside the European Union, you have a much higher risk for being poverty and social exclusion. And this trend is pretty much even across. It's interesting is Serbia, for example, is almost the same. Or Bulgaria, if you're from another EU country or outside Europe, is much higher risk. So again, as a healthcare professional, you need to be aware where your clients are from and how this interferes or affects. So if we then talk about impact on health. So for a healthcare professional, it is essential to be aware of the indicators of poverty or social exclusion, and who is at risk in order to provide an adequate provision of care. It is though of equal importance that healthcare professionals thoroughly understand the impact that being at risk of poverty or social exclusion has on health. For example, as we talked earlier about COVID. So in European Union, those individuals with lower education have a lower life expectancy and are more likely to be in worse health than better educated individuals. And this influenced them life expectancy and inequalities. Difference in between life expectancy between individuals living in the most deprived areas versus the richest areas in England, for example, is for women 7.1 years and for men 9.2 years. But the important aspect and also the scary aspect is that the differences have increased over years. And that is not just in England, that is also in Europe or most westernized world in US, Australia and so on. And most likely also in Asia. Um, so when we then look at the self-perceived health in EU, age 16 and above, and we're looking at the share of people that describe their health as good or very good, increase with the level of education and income. So 20% of the richest population only report 3.9% of bad or very bad self-perceived health versus the 20 poorest is for over 13% and so on. So this clearly shows how the socioeconomic status influences us in EU and how we feel our subjective health. And again, when we look on the data across the board from the different countries, blue is the highest income and gray is the lowest income. And this again, 
percentage of population aged 16 years and over reporting good to very good health. You see it across all, excuse me, you see it across all countries, but those that have lower socioeconomic status report worse health. And this has an impact because people with lower levels of education have a higher risk of suffering from certain illness than those with a high level of education. Lower level of education increase your risk for depression, about 3.12 times higher, diabetes, and obesity. So this is important factors for us to consider. And then access to care then. In the EU, on average, individuals in the low income group report four times more unmet medical needs for financial, geographic, or waiting time versus individuals in the high income groups. There is, though, a considerable difference across Europe. For instance, in Latvia, 25%, in Greece, 17%, the lowest income groups stated unmet needs. So again, the average in EU is four times, those in lower socioeconomic group have four times more unmet medical needs, but it depends on the countries. And how this is shaped is when you actually have to look at the economical policy, the country, the PPS, as the map I showed you earlier, then how much the, each country provides on health expenditure, as we also talked about. And then we have the social determinants of health, the level of education, the type of occupation an individual has, the income. And these factors together generate a social gradient in health for us. So what are then the barriers to access healthcare for social disadvantaged groups then? It's important because we're gonna improve our healthcare provision we need to know the barriers. And these barriers are, for example, language and communication with health professionals. Health professionals lack of experience in, in dealing with differences, structural inequalities, organizational barriers, culture and faith, mental health, and fear and social stigma. So all of these things we need to address in our healthcare settings. And it's not just in Europe. This is a global phenomenon, unfortunately. So then the question is, how do we evaluate access to care? How are we going to take the wisdom we have from the projects? And if we look at this map here or diagram, you can see you need an available healthcare structure. And that needs to be inclusive. And the training in the system for us that work in the healthcare structure and what we need is this aspect. And this is what the patients need. But the patient's capacity is very important to understand. Is their ability to perceive? Are we good in health literacy or are we healthy literacy? How do we trust the profession? What is the personal and social values? How do we get to the hospital, for example, and so on. What are the income? How is the health system? Is it private? Do you need to pay? Is it all free? And so on. And you cannot generate one model for everyone in this. You need actually generate and think, how does this work for a high income patient? How does it work for a low income, middle income, if they're from another country, and order and this is the only way we can start addressing the health inequalities we have in our societies. We need to generate a health system that is accommodating. It needs to be inclusive for everyone, not just for a few. So in conclusion then, you can say to, oh, sorry, it's still messing up, is if you live, have good education and stuff, living country, your access to health is quite easy. But if you're from a lower socioeconomic group or have even more burdens from another countries, have unemployed, your access to health is much more burdensome. That means also a lot of people more will fail. They might not understand the information and so on. 
what to do in, in, for example, when it's a pandemic. This is clear, and that's why also some of studies that shows where the higher mortality and lower socioeconomic groups during this pandemic is people don't have access to healthcare the same way, they don't understand information provided, and so forth. And there, we as healthcare professionals, we actually have failed in a way, and we need to change this, both on the bottom level and the top level. So, Thank you so much for listening. I did this a little bit quicker and I do apologize for my slideshow getting a life of its own. So I will stop sharing here and saying thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Martin. Exactly 20 minutes, so not a second longer. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we will uh, get back to you at the end of the session. So we have uh, the next presentation of course, uh, yeah, the fifth presentation uh, is from uh, Professor Gisela Sol, and she is an uh, associate professor in physiotherapy, University of Otago. Uh, she has extensive clinical experience in musculoskeletal physiotherapy, sports injury, and pain. So, uh, uh, primary research uh, interest in, uh, relate to rehabilitation and outcomes of patients with anterior cruciate ligament injuries. and uh, so, uh, yes, that is uh, probably, yes, that is what she's going to talk to you, uh, us, talk to us today. So, uh, to, uh, to talk to us on anterior cruciate ligament rehabilitation and outcomes, I would like to invite uh, Associate Professor Isela Sol from the uh, School of Physiotherapy, University of Otago, New Zealand. Over to you, Isela. Can you see this? Yes, we can. Yeah. Good evening. Here in New Zealand, it is now nearly 10, uh, quarter past 10, but I'll say, I will say good afternoon to you. And thank you so much for this invitation. I really do appreciate it. And as the other speakers already said, it wouldn't it have been nice if we could have met face to face. I'm going to call, call this talk, preparing a person with ACL rupture for chaos and confusion with confidence. And you'll see from this talk where, where that comes from. Um, I live in Dunedin in, and work at the University of Otago. And Dunedin is on the lower part of the South Island of New Zealand. Um, and it's a university town. So in, in the city of about 120,000 people, 20,000 of them are students. So the university plays an enormous role in this, in this town. My clinical background with ACL rehabilitation extends back to the mid 1980s, where we were very conservative in terms of the rehabilitation. For example, post-surgery, we were not allowed to do any active extension of the knee for six weeks so that we did not put any undue stress or strain across the ACL graft. And those patients often ended up with severe stiffness and quadriceps weakness. In the mid 1990s, we started with more accelerated rehabilitation based on information from the USA where they got their, their for example, their basketball players back onto the court within six months. The 10 years after that, we, we, we moved back to more moderate um, um, progressions and a very individualized patient-centered patient care. And, and now we discourage sport for most people um, before nine months. Um, uh, this is more the team-based team sports. And we know that if we hold them back for one more month, with each increasing month, there is more protection in terms of re-risk. So what I want to highlight in this talk is the multidimensional influences of an ACL rupture on the person and also the importance of long-term rehabilitation and maintenance of muscle strength, the unpredictability and skills training. In New Zealand, um, approximately 80% of individuals with an ACL rupture do undergo reconstruction. And we have one of the high, highest incidences of reconstruction in the world. I think we are just following the U USA. 71% of our patients um, receive a hamstring graft and 24% have a patella graft. 
And we have a national accident insurance, the ACC, which covers the medical care and surgery, and now also provides an expedited care to surgery and also access to physiotherapy. We did have to, patients did have to pay a surcharge for every physiotherapy session until about a, a one year ago or two years ago. And we found that there was an inequity in terms of access. We have patients who could not afford that surcharge, only access physiotherapy for minimal sessions following ACL um, rupture. So that has changed over the last few years. Long-term outcomes of ACL ruptures are important to understand. Um, although many uh, individuals undergo reconstruction to allow them to get back to sport, it's only about 55% of competitive athletes who can return back to the same level um, of sports um, for more than two years. And that is based on a systematic review. There's also the higher incidence of knee osteoarthritis within 10 to 15 years following ACL reconstruction or also an ACL rupture managed conservatively. So if you have a soccer player who ruptures the ACL at the age of 16, often by the age of 30, they may have some symptoms of knee osteoarthritis. So we do need strategies to improve return to walk, walk and to work and also return to sports and to minimize risk for future knee related disability. So we do need to consider the patient from a social perspective, psychological and also physical outcomes of the rupture. The research we've done here at the University of Otago has a quantitative approach and also a qualitative approach. And I'll, I'll um, mention three qualitative studies that we've done. The first one was done by Sarah Scott, an honor student of mine, um, who listened to the stories of people with ACL reconstruction within two years post-surgery. And a strong theme that came through that study was that rehabilitation is not always a straight path. It is a very convoluted journey of improving and then regressing, improving and regressing. Other two themes that came up were the importance of the support system and the care pathway. And all of these patients were talking about how important the medical team was, which is part of the care pathway, and also how important the sports team was in terms of con uh, constantly supporting them, or maybe the lack of that, that support from the, from the sports team that then had a negative influence on their journey. Family was really important. And over time, that family commitment also changes and often feeds towards an um, insecurity in terms of whether or not they would return back to their sports. So the, the relationship with the clinicians is absolutely important. So we as clinicians play an enormous role in terms of the recovery of our patients with ACL injuries. We need to develop that therapeutic alliance and really listen to our patients. Overall, the, the patients we're talking about, the ACL injury not just being in yet another injury, it is a serious injury to them as person. And some of them described how they lost their sense of identity with that injury, at least for a moment. Mandeep Kaur um, was a PhD student of mine. She's now at the University of Virginia in the United States. She explored outcomes of ACL injuries between two years up to 10, up to 20 years. And from a qualitative study, um, she explored in particular the fear of re-injury or the concern about re-injury, which is a, a real emotion of patients with ACL ruptures with many of them. And she had two main themes. One of them was the contributors to, to fear of re-injury. The other one was the behavioral manif manifestation of, of that fear. And what these patients explained again is, is that an ACL rupture is an enormous injury and they just did not ever want to experience that pain again, as you can see on the face of this netball player. It is a very serious um, um, pain. And if they get surgery, then that pain gets repeated again a second time. And it was that fear of that pain that, that led to some of them not going back to, to their um, pre-injury level of sports. They also had a fear, of, or they had that memory of the inciting movement that caused the ACL injury, that that was imprinted in their, in their memory. 
and they would try to avoid that very specific movement as much as they could. They were also very concerned or had fear for another long rehabilitation, particularly because they knew how difficult it was for them to, to um, build up the muscle strength again. And then some of them cha um, described changed family responsibilities. If they were 10 years after the ACL uh, rupture, many of them had family and they, they considered that they wouldn't have had the time anymore for another long rehabilitation because of their responsibilities, for example, with children. So all of these factors they described as, as, as factors that, that feed into their fear of re-injury. And because of that fear of re-injury, they were more aware of the environmental environment. For example, here in Dunedin, um, in the cold winters, um, the, rugby or the, um, the rugby or soccer players were very concerned of slippery fields or icy fields. They had lost confidence in themselves as a sports person, and they clearly described hesitation in very specific movements. And quite often that movement was related to the inciting and in, um, movement of the injury. And some of them were using bracing um, during play in order to improve their confidence in the knee. Now, so a, an ACL injury is not only a physical injury. There are some studies, and this is an older study now, and Professor Liang probably, Liang probably has a nose of more recent ones, where if MRI was being used after ACL rupture. In this study, where the authors compared um, if MRI between males with ACL deficient knees, these did not get re reconstruction at the time, compared their findings to 18 healthy males. And they, um, when the, the participant was in the fMRI, they were asked to extend and flex the knee while, while lying in the supine position. And there were some differences between those two groups that were evident. For example, here, the blue column is the um, control post, uh, uh, is the control group, and the red is the ACL injured group. And in this area here, the sensory motor cortex region, the controls appear to have higher activity than the ACL injured um, people. That may be possibly, from my perspective, due to loss of or decreased proprioception, decreased sensory information coming from, from the knee. When looking at the visual um, cortex here on the left, the injured people appear to have higher activity than, than the controls. And that might be that injured um, people with ACL deficiency use more vision to compensate perhaps for loss of proprioception or sensory motor input from that knee. So that this study is one of probably others as well that show that after an ACL injury, one can monitor changes in brain activity. So it is not only a physiological movement at the knee, you could say that there are changes in brain activity as well. In the quantitative studies from, um, from our university, this goes back to Mandeep Kaur's PhD again, in a systematic review, um, it was very clear that after an ACL reconstruction, people walk with less knee flexion and also have lower knee flexion moments. And part of the algorithm to calculate flexion moments is um, using the ground reaction forces. So if the, the, it's evident that people walk with less knee flexion moments, it might be that they reluctant to bear weight on that side. So using compensatory mechanisms. So it's very clear from the literature that there's asymmetry in gait in the long term. And we conducted studies in terms of stepping up and also stepping down and also during jumping, and we found the same. In terms of quality of life, there's a group of people with ACL um, reconstructions that still have long-term um, low quality of life. And that is often associated together with low levels of physical activity. So that is a problem in the long-term. In our studies as well, when we tested the people on a biotex um, isokinetic dynamometer, we found long-term quadriceps and, fle and flexion muscle weakness compared to the opposite side. And the opposite side might also be weaker compared to controls, perhaps with a decreased levels of physical activity over time. So how important is the thigh muscle strength for function? Well, we did some um, secondary studies or analyses of our data 
for example, um, when comparing or when looking for the relationship between concentric quadriceps muscle strength and uh, um, the knee flexion moments, we found a positive relationship. In a linear regression, we found that 56% of, of variance of the knee flexion moments was explained by quadriceps muscle strength. And that applied more for the, for the females than, uh, than the men. And quite often, the, the women have a greater loss of quadriceps strength following surgery, despite of rehabilitation. So we know that patients who have weak quadriceps muscle strength also walk, walk with lower knee moments, and that feeds into the asymmetry of gait. So it highlights the importance of improving muscle strength, particularly in women, in, in the long term. And we need to consider that the decreased moments at the knee may be protective rather than mal maladaptive. But if it is protective, we can um, undertake quadriceps muscle exercises to, in an attempt to, to improve the symmetry. Another question we wanted to know is how uh, whether fear of re-injury was associated with the muscle strength as well. So looking for an association between a physical factor with the psychological factor. We use a questionnaire that Kate Webster from Australia had developed to, to assess fear of re-injury and a score of 80 out of 80 on that questionnaire indicates high levels of fear of re-injury or low levels of confidence. And low levels on that score mean high, it means um, low, low fear of re-injury and high levels of confidence. And what we found here, there was a strong correlation between the concentric quadriceps muscle strength and the fear of re-injury re in such way that those who have, are strong, who have recovered um, much of the quadriceps strength had, low, had lower levels of fear of re-injury. So muscle strength was associated with improved confidence in their knee. So that shows that by work, by improving quadriceps strength, we may also have an influence on the psychological experience or um, con uh, construct of confidence versus fear of re-injury. And that is also supported by a new study from a group in the USA. You also found that confidence was associated with quadriceps strength gain. So what we implement in our rehabilitation with our patients in terms of physical strength has an influence on the emotions, on the psych psychology of fear of re-injury. In another qualitative study, Karen Mahoud was another honor student of mine, and he wanted to listen to people with ACL injuries who considered that their rehabilitation had gone really well and they had been successful. And the themes that came through through that study was that these, these um, participants had a very strong athletic identity and they did not want to give that up. So they worked really hard. They considered themselves to be mentally tough and they were committed towards the rehabilitation. So those were the drivers to, to um, the intrinsic drivers to return to sport. They spoke about preparation of the body as well as of the mind. And here they also included the connectedness with the, therapy, um, with the clinicians, again, highlighting how important that relationship with the clinicians was to get them through those low levels in the rehabilitation. They definitely described the physical rehabilitation, but some of them also described the cognitive skills. Some had been in therapy with mental skills coaches or with psychologists, often because of other issues that, that they had dealt with earlier in their life. And in this stage, they, they applied those skills, the mental skills that they'd learned previously to problem solve um, their strategies in terms of the ACL injuries. So if we as clinicians, as physiotherapists, learn how to use those cognitive skills and teach our patients those, that probably will help them as well to deal with possible fear of re-injury or concern of re-injury. And at the end of the day, they described that they just had to accept a risk when they return back onto the field to the team sports. So they learned how to assess risk instantaneously, for example, during a game um, where they very quickly had to made, make a decision of whether they would avoid a specific movement or adapt in some other way. 
There was also a group of patients who said, I'm just not worried. So there were some laid back people who are who do not develop that fear of re injury following that injury. Um, and they can just get lost in the moment in the game. One um, rugby player described how her coach um, or constantly encouraged them um, that they were not ready to get back on the field if they were not ready for chaos and confusion. If you imagine a rugby game or soccer game or a netball game, um, the player cannot think about the knee. They must be ready to go into the chaos and the, the um, unpredictability of that sport. And they need to be able to do that with confidence. So we learned from this study of how patients who did well after an ACL injury, how they prepared themselves in the rehabilitation. So implications, and I must say that I'm not in the, I'm coming from the wrong country in order to give you advice about COVID, because we've been really very fortunate here. But I can give some implications for um, patients who live in the COVID environment and for the clinicians. We definitely do need to focus on strengthening quadriceps and hamstring muscles in these patients. Thinking about exercises that the patients can do at home if they don't have direct access to clinical practice under the COVID restrictions. And here are some examples of exercises that can be done at home and in the home scenario. We need to also include unpredict unpredictability and perturbations in our exercises in all different di diagonals to prepare the patient for the chaos that is part of normal sports. And we may have to spend time with them on the field to improve that confidence, their own confidence and their abilities by encouraging on, um, them on that pathway. We do need to listen to our, pa our patients, consider their beliefs, their anxieties, to, um, talk to them about their family situation, their school situation, their work situation, because all of those factors feed into possible anxieties and concerns about moving forward. And we may need to develop skills such as motivational interviewing to get to the bottom of their individual stories. For some of them, we have to counsel them to, to look for an alternative sports um, if that is needed, if, if their knee does not recover in the way that was expected. And the bottom line is that rehabilitation is never complete after an ACL injury. They may return to sports, but they will regress at some stage. And that is where booster sessions may be needed, just to give them that edge and that, that confidence in themselves as well. There may need to be behavior changes, because quite often we find that at five or 10 years post ACL injury, if they have returned to a more sedentary lifestyle, they, they, um, the body weight increases, and that gets them into a, a negative um, cycle to various conditions, metabolic um, conditions that may influence the knee as well. So ACL rehabilitation must consider the whole person. It is not only a knee injury, it also influences how the brain interprets sensory motor information from the periphery and how it moves. If it is a cricketer, having an ACL rupture may influence the mechanics of the shoulder. And then you may get um, concerns from the coach about performance um, lack of performance improvement. So one needs to consider them that patient in their society, in their workplace, make the workplace safe and also very supportive of the person. As clinicians, we need to work with the coaches, with the managers and the team members to make sure that the, the athlete remains included, for example, as, as the water carrier or as, as part of a warm up. And then our role as a healthcare team member is really to get to know that person and support them through that very long rehabilitation. So the bottom line is that we do need to consider the patient, in the psychological domain and the biological domain, as well as in their society, in their social domain. So that is all that I wanted to share with you. Quick snapshot of the research we've been doing here. Um, and it would really be nice to catch up with you in person at some stage. And that's my talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gisela. And uh, so that concludes the presentations. And uh, the session is now open for questions and answers. Uh, so all the panelists, uh, the speakers are here. So um, just
since we have run out of, I mean, uh, exceeded our scheduled time, so we have about uh, 10, 15 minutes for questions. Uh, if you have any questions from the audience, you can, uh, I'm not sure whether uh, the controllers allow the, uh, the audience to talk. So if you raise hand, probably they can unmute you or you can uh, put your questions in the chat box. So they have a very uh, interesting presentation. So I'm sure so we have a reasonable number of audience. Most of them uh, like to be students. So you might be having questions. Don't worry, you can ask any questions. So there are no uh, unimportant questions or silly questions or nothing like that. So question is a question. So we encourage you to talk and like say get your, especially if you are a student, like say, this is a very rare chance that you would get to talk to uh, or rather get your doubts cleared by a panel of a very uh, internationally renowned panel of speakers. So don't miss your chance. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, Diniti, yes. Uh, yes, I am Diniti from Department of Nursing. My question goes to Professor Martin regarding his presentation. So uh, in his valuable presentation, he talked about the vulnerable groups, the poverty and the uh, social exclusion <clears throat> and how it uh, affects on the health outcomes. So my question is whether uh, that you have identified any strategies uh, to overcome barriers to better health outcomes in vulnerable populations. Thank you. Um, a very interesting question. What we do currently in a lot of projects we're running in Europe, so European project, is we develop training material for healthcare professionals to train them in how to identify if a patient is from a vulnerable group and so forth and change their approach. So we're trying to deliver more a person-centered approach. So if as you, for example, encounter a person from a lower socioeconomics, you change your style of speaking, you explain it more, take a little bit more of a background, because some of the advice you might give is not suitable for somebody in lower socioeconomic background or depending on where we're living. It's further away for treatment, maybe. They don't have uh, resources and so on. So that is the first step to do it. So we work very much on the grassroots level. Then on the European level, we have a European Union, and they say that every European citizen should have equal access to care, which is a wonderful vision. But we are quite far away with it, as we are far away with um, artificial intelligence, for example, taking sharks. So, but I'm quite right that we will be able to change this perception, but it does take time. And the first step is that new and old healthcare professionals and social workers are trained in this forward. Did that answer your question? Yes, Professor, thank you very much. You're welcome. Professor Martin, my question is uh, again to you. Thank you very much for your uh, very interesting presentation. Actually, uh, may I know, do you have any uh, financing mechanisms and benefit arrangements for uh, the social health protection among your countries, that many EU countries? Uh, what do you mean with uh, financial, social? Financial, or oh, the mechanisms uh, that mean common. Malik, is that? Uh... This is Malika, right? Yeah. Yes. Your question, can you more elaborate on this one? Are you asking about any financial or any support for these uh, oh, among, vulnerable groups? Yeah, vulnerable groups among uh, their countries, EU countries, uh, Norway, and uh, uh, yeah, EU countries, European countries. I mean, yes. Um, uh, I can give my country, Sweden, as an example. We do have, if you're unemployed, we have a lot of support for vulnerable groups and so on. But they are not 
in relation to what you need to survive or function better. And from Swedish state, that we know that these groups that receive uh, unemployment, for example, or social support, they live in worse areas in Sweden versus, or more rural, for example, they have worse health outcomes in contrast to the people that don't need support and they work. So the support is obviously good, but we still need to be able to change somehow we still improve these people's quality of life, both physically and mentally, because being unemployed and receiving welfare is very bad for a mental health bill, mental well-being. They have a much higher risk for psychiatric disease and so forth, versus, for example, if you have a secure employment and you can earn your money yourself. So it's not just about the support you can give, it's also the resources you can generate around it. But we're not there yet. As, and this is a common problem in many countries. Okay, thank you. And uh, in addition to that, uh, do you stratify these vulnerable groups uh, like uh, that means uh, specific population groups, including women, elderly, uh, or migrants, like oh, yes. um, rural or so, urban? Yes, uh, the stratification of Sweden is quite easy because Sweden, when we, we have a very good population databases, and I work with them myself. So when we can easily stratify for level of education, age, region, and so on, which makes the data much more comprehensible and understandable, which is a good strength. Um, I do that a lot in my own research in Cleflip and Palette. So okay. we can stratify the data. And that's a very good question because without stratification, it's hard to make generalizations and so on. So good. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor. You're welcome. Anyone else? Hello. Yeah, Amara. Yes, I would like to ask a question from Professor Sola from uh, University of Otago regarding her uh, ACL rehabilitation. Yep. Yeah, she's here. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, in your, how do you manage the pain in your patient? Do you apply any electrical modalities to reduce the pain? What kind in of treatment strategies do you use? In New Zealand, we do not use much electrotherapy. Mm -hmm. There are some physio physiotherapists who will use acupuncture. Mm -hmm. um, we do use manual therapy, and then we would um, revert back to um, use of ice if the patient finds that helpful. So it's very much individualized, and the acute phase is just normal um, pain care. So in, in terms of physiotherapy, we do not use much electrotherapy here in New Zealand. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And allowing time to heal is really important. Okay. Yeah. We can allow a couple of questions. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Actually, uh, those all five uh, talks are highly, you know, time important. Thank you very much for uh, you all joining uh, and uh, sharing your experience. Actually, my uh, I had a major interest on two uh, speeches because I'm a, a professionally a radiographer and a senior lecturer of uh, the university. And uh, actually, uh, I would like to share one experience. A couple of months ago, I made a search on PubMed. That day I found 99 papers related to artificial intelligence and COVID-19 uh, diagnosis. So uh, actually, uh, uh, interesting thing is that uh, half, of, half of those papers were from China, and uh, uh, the other half of papers were coming from uh, the US, United States. So my question goes to uh, Professor Liang Mang, uh, joined from uh, Tianjin Medical University, China. Uh, he mentioned that already uh, China has given the permission to use artificial intelligence to diagnose lung cancer screening and also coronary artery diseases. 
So my question is why they are uh, still lagging behind to use uh, the artificial intelligence to diagnose COVID uh, lungs or COVID uh, uh, using uh, computer tomography or sometimes using uh, the MRI. So why they are still lagging behind of application of uh, uh, artificial intelligence in COVID-19 diagnosis? Okay, um, it's a good question, yeah. Uh, but I think for any products such as AI system, actually for any products to be allowed uh, to be used in the real clinical practice, we need to be sure that this, this AI system uh, is really um, good at uh, the task we want it to do. Uh, for, uh, uh, for, for the AI models, it has been uh, developed so far. Uh, we, I think the main reason is that we are not uh, entirely sure that those systems are um, really reliable in diagnosing the COVID-19 um, uh, patients. Um, one, one thing is for a, for a model uh, to, be, uh, to perform well, we need a lot of data, we need big data to train the model. And, um, but so far, I think those models, they are not developed, they are not trained um, using a very, I think, big enough data. Uh, the other reason is that, well, in order to, to be sure that the model is reliable, uh, we need a lot of test data uh, to, to assess the performance of the model. Um, but I think for now, we also haven't done this work to, to make sure that those models can be generalized uh, to, any, uh, to, to other uh, patients in other hospitals. I think that would be the main reason. And also because in this pandemic, um, uh, I, I think that the period is still not long enough to, for us to get uh, enough data to get that point yet. But I think it, and it will be soon, I think, Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, my question goes to Professor Gisela Zol. Uh, Ma'am, uh, following uh, ankle sprains, uh, that's a condition called chronic ankle instability. The recurrent ankle sprains can happen. That's the same way. Can you, uh, did you identify chronic uh, knee instability? And that was that is my first question. The next one is, uh, did you find any relationship between a knee jerk reflex uh, with the ankle, with the uh, knee uh, ACL injuries? So the, the first question was... Chronic ankle uh, instability versus chronic knee instability. Yes. I am not looking at ankle injuries in my research. Um, but there may be similar cons uh, consequences of ACL, a of ankle injuries, um, particularly when they become chronic, that they do interfere with a person's life and may also lead to changes in sports, for example, or in physical activity. So there will be similarities um, between those two injuries. But in terms of medical care, ACL ruptures normally lead to more costs and more and longer rehabilitation. Did I answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Have you found any, any relationship between the knee jerk reflex uh, uh, with uh, knee uh, ACL injuries? I am. I haven't um, explored research in that field, and I'm not aware of of others here looking at that. Okay, ma'am. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Right. Uh, all right. Uh, it seems there are no more questions. Uh, so thank you very much. And uh, so we had a very interesting session in this afternoon. So first we had uh, uh, Professor uh, Stephen and Malbert speaking about um, the use of art, uh, sorry, uh, the US experience with the COVID-19 pandemic and we saw a lot of uh, uh, stories and like say how uh, they reacted and we, we are 
we we could draw some parallels uh, from our experience as well and then uh, he went on to i mean describe about the importance of providing uh, proper instructions and uh, at the proper time so it's a very very important aspect in the management of the pandemic because we saw uh, this misinformation and like say uh, information not uh, receiving to the public at the uh, the the proper time has caused a lot of lives in the world in, including our i um, mean in, uh, in our country so we have seen that so so that is that is a very uh, touching i mean uh, rather uh, it's very, something very close to uh, what we experience today so thank you very much uh, Sir albert for that presentation and then uh, professor meng liang uh, talked to us about uh, the artificial intelligence uh, in radiological diagnosis so uh, so one of the key uh, things that he mentioned is that uh, it should be i mean uh, the human cannot be replaced by the so the machine so there should be a proper combination of the two for the betterment uh, or the better outcome uh, so the so that is that is uh, the best thing that i heard from that and also he uh, he mentioned so for the finally so <clears throat> he discussed about uh, the challenges right uh, of using artificial intelligence and like uh, and also the the pros and cons both they were discussed very very clearly and uh, uh, in a very unbiased manner and he ended up saying that uh, the prospects are bright but the roads have twists and turns so yes of course uh, we have to understand that there's no easy path in conquering anything uh, in this world today so then uh, the third speak uh, speech was from uh, as his, uh, professor uh, uh, napa pong uh, so I am sorry if I mis I pronounced mispronounced your name. So, like my name is very very often mispronounced. So, so I know the experience when it happens. So thank you very much <laughs> anyway right. uh, right. for your uh, experience sharing. And uh, you also mentioned about the importance of communication and also uh, sharing experience, uh, like uh, how you shared your experience with the the global community and your colleagues in the other countries and how that experience was used to. Uh, improve the guidelines and uh, so because uh, having guidelines is very important so i am a dental surgeon so i know how this there are so many controversial and like say contrasting guidelines coming on every way so therefore it's very important that uh, some people who are authorized or rather have experience like you take in the lead and provide in these guidelines for your profession thank you very much for joining with us right. then the fourth presentation was from uh was a martin person and uh, uh, from the questions that we received, I, I can, uh, I can tell that uh, it took uh, very close to our uh, audience. And uh, <clears throat> again, because uh, I think the experience is very, very closer to what we experience in this country. Like uh, we also experience the the people from low like, socioeconomic positions, uh, uh, positions, and also a low education with low education backgrounds uh, being uh, victims of the COVID pandemic uh, in our country as well. So. Uh, it's kind of uh, uh, so now we understand that the uh, the situation in the I mean throughout the globe is more or less same in that aspect at least. So then uh, of course uh, you uh, highlighted the importance of identifying these groups and uh, like you also talked about the the need to include uh, be inclusive of these people when you uh, plan the, uh, the health guidelines and uh, treatments and uh, so so those are and. Of course, uh, we are always talking here in this country also about equal, uh, having equal access or rather making equal access to the uh, care available for everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Martin, uh, for your presentation. And then finally, uh, I thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Gisela, for staying uh, late in the night. Uh, I know that the time difference uh, uh, is uh, nearly five hours, so even more than that between Sri Lanka and New Zealand. And uh, so you highlighted the uh, a very important uh, aspect in the, I mean, the face, a very uh, important sort of a uh, injury that is a uh, <clears throat> the ACL injury for sportsmen and women. So, and you highlighted the importance of uh, having this uh, considered in the social, psychological, and biological domains in, uh, man in the management and how the support you care is as uh, equally important as the medical and the, uh, the professional health care. And I'm sure that uh, our, our uh, audience would uh, benefit from your experience a lot. Thank you very much. So uh, that summarizes the session. And uh, as all five of you mentioned, we also feel that uh, 
it would have been wonderful if you if we could meet in person uh, i mean uh, that was prevented by the pandemic but uh, i am sure that if we work together like as people from different healthcare professions and also uh, if we act uh, realizing our social uh, responsibilities this pandemic uh, will can be defeated and we will have some uh, time in the near future to meet in person uh, in this country thank you very much again so thank you thank you for joining today thank you okay thank you, thank you. Thank you, sir, for moderating the session into a fruitful discussion. And we have been listening to eminent speakers deliberating from different fields. And now we have come to the end of the plenary session of Allied Health Sciences of 14th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kotalawala Defense University 2021. Before winding up the session, I would like to invite Dr. Diyu Kottahachi, the Dean, Faculty of Allied Health Sciences, to symbolize the awarding of mementos as a token of our appreciation to our distinguished plenary speakers. And on behalf of the plenary speakers, I cordially invite on stage their respective facilitators to receive their mementos. First, on behalf of Professor Stephen N. Albert from Department of Behavioral and Community Health Sciences, Graduate School of Public Health, University of Petersburg, USA, I kindly invite Ms. S.U. Kankanange to receive the memento on behalf of Professor Stephen. Thank you. And then Professor Meng Liang from School of Medical Imaging, Tianjin Medical University, China. I kindly invite Dr. W. M. Adiriyarachi to receive the memento on behalf of Professor Liang. And uh, Dr. W. M. Adiriyarachi, please remain on the stage. And also, I would like to invite to receive the memento on behalf of Assistant Professor Napapong Pongnapang from Department of Radiological Technology, Faculty of Medical Technology, Mahidol University, Thailand. And then Professor Martin Person from Faculty of Health Sciences, Christian Stud University, Sweden. I cordially invite Dr. M. P. K. W. Abe Singh to receive the memento on behalf of Professor Martin. Thank you. And then Associate Professor Gisela Sole from School of Physiotherapy, University of Otago, New Zealand. I kindly invite Mr. S. A. D. C. S. Seniviratna to receive the memento on behalf of Professor Gisela Sole. Sir, please remain on stage. One more memento to be given. And then I would like to invite Dr. H.M.A.J. Halahakorn to present, to symbolize the receiving of the memento as a token of appreciation to the chairperson of the session, Professor B.M.H.S.K. Banahekar from Department of Basic Sciences, Faculty of Dental Sciences, University of Peradeniya, Sri Lanka, for his invaluable cooperation and participation for the session. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of the plenary session of Allied Health Sciences of 14th International Research Conference of KDU. Before winding up the session, on behalf of the organizing committee, I express my sincere thanks to the chairperson of the session, Professor BMHSK Banahekar, for taking time off his busy schedule to participate in the session, and also to the distinguished plenary speakers for their invaluable contribution and the audience for your participation. Thanks again for joining us today. 
and we will see you tomorrow at the technical sessions. With that, we conclude the plenary session of Allied Health Sciences of the 14th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kotelawala Defence University 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise up for the National Anthem of Sri Lanka. Thank you. Have a good day. Stay safe.